And if you could just really quickly, how are Jan's particles made just briefly? Because like you said, if it's so difficult, what do we have today? And then what do you think it will look like in the future? Correct. So that actually has been a major effort in my lab. And I'm among the very first few researchers start to tackle the problem. Uh, we mentioned several methods throughout the years. And one easy method is by directional coding. If you lay down a one single layer of particles on a flat substrate, then you do the... Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the It's Material World podcast. I'm your co-host, Puneet, and joining me today is David. What's new in your world, David? Yeah, I'm about to start a new job soon, so just getting ready. Uh, it'll be with Tesla in California, so Ooh. I'm about to move out and um, move across the country, so <laughs> getting ready and um, very excited. Uh, but yeah, I start that very soon, so... That's nice. what's up. You got everything you? you got everything situated in terms of getting everything transported to California, getting the apartment ready and everything? Uh, more or less. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's just going to be a bunch of suitcases, but it's been quite the challenge getting everything ready. And so if anybody else can be across the country, I sympathize with you as I, I, um, I'm subleasing an apartment, but it took like a month and a half to do it. So I started in November, but I think I just got my lease like a week ago. So oh um, really, really down the wire though. Like <laughs> I started like quite a long time ago. So um, I, I, so it's quite stressful, but I think everything's in place. If not, I'll make it happen. It's going to be living, living off the streets for a little bit. While yeah, the yeah I have to go up. to a hotel or something. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my life has not been nearly as hectic or stressful. I've got my home situation figured out, not moving, uh, not moving this semester. Um, but yeah, I think for, for this episode, we really dove into um, a new concept or a concept that was at least new to me called Janus particles. And basically, you know, it's different from homogeneous chemistries where it's like a two-sided nature. Um, and Janus is, I believe, like a two-faced god. Um, and so it, and it inherently has different properties based on like the side of the particle, if I'm understanding correctly. And that's why there's a, a lot of potential that the market isn't quite set for Janus particles, but there are a lot of different potential applications. And so it's a super interesting, fascinating episode that uh, where we dive into. Um, but I just wanted to see if you had any favorite tidbits from the episode that you want our listeners to look out for. Yeah, I think there's a few things that really stood out to me. I think the first thing is that um, our guest, Sean Jiang, is almost a very realist um, professor. And so he was very honest about how he's taking his approach to his startup, which does Janus Particles, and kind of what it takes to scale a new technology. And I think a lot of ways, it's like he was saying, is like, oh, I want to like cure cancer immediately and like this can help. But really like, there's a lot of regulations, there's a lot of issues and like to prove that it's even like should be considered, you will have to take a much less like, um, like exciting approach. And so his first application was wood uh, finish. And so I think that it just shows that the technology is still there and it's still building upon itself, but you have to take a lot of stepping stones to get to where you want to in the end. And so his goal is very, um, very real where just continue to build upon his success. And so I really enjoyed that. The other parts is just, he goes into detail about his advice as someone who has jumped back and forth from academia to industry. And so I think that a lot of people consider which route to go through at the end of their college experience. And so I think it's really interesting to hear from a man who's done both and he basically says that you can do both and it just takes self-belief and persistence to get through it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then my last thing that I really enjoyed was uh, you have to stay till the end. Puneeth makes a great joke about VOCs. Oh, God. So, <laughs> and, so, and so you have to wait till the end to understand what a VOC is and why uh, Puneeth's joke was funny. <laughs> You're stealing all of my thunder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you just chose three of them. Uh, but no, no, I, I totally agree. I thought 
just to add on to what you said, he had this combination of an industry and academic focused background. And um, he talks about how his industry background applies to his current academic research, as well as, you know, the company that that's in the works, right. Um, and so that is how this like natural product market fit is coming to fruition is based on his uh, coding background, right. And so that's how he has found this I guess, intersection between Janus particles and a potential application like coatings. Um, and I agree that I think that you can dream big, but you have to hit the stepping stones to get there. And that's exactly what he's doing. There's potential applications uh, in drug delivery, in concrete, and prolonging the shelf life of um, various, you know, various products. And so he just mentioned that for example, with drug delivery, that is a long, long process to get everything approved. It's a lot of regulations, believe me, I know, being in the medical device industry. Um, and so it's just really cool to see him explain what exactly Janus particles are, you know, how is it made, what are the processing challenges, and be very real about the, the timeline of it and what needs to be done to overcome those challenges. So there's really a lot to look forward to here. And my favorite part of the episode was honestly the end. He shared a lot of great advice, also very motivational and inspirational. So for, for students in particular, but any listener um, will really enjoy the tidbits of advice that he shared at the end. So is there anything you want to add before we get into the episode? Just stay till the end for the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let's get into it. Meta Material Inc. is a developer of high-performance functional materials and nanocomposites. Meta delivers previously unachievable performance across a range of applications by inventing, designing, developing, and manufacturing sustainable, highly functional materials. Meta is a fast-growing company with a positive and committed work culture and a phenomenally talented workforce. Our employees are inspired to do exceptional and innovative work and are proud to contribute to the success of the company and they are our greatest asset. Meta attracts people from all countries and cultures with over 35 spoken languages represented across all our teams. Meta believes that diversity drives creativity and innovation. With locations in Canada, the United States, the UK, and Greece, Meta is growing and is looking for new talented people to join the team. If you're passionate about doing your best work, making a difference, and having fun while doing it, apply to one of our open positions at metamaterial.com careers. All right. Hello, everyone. For today's episode, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Shan Jiang. Since earning his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, he's in a postdoc at MIT and then has worked at the Dow Chemical Company as a project leader and scientist. He's currently a tenured professor at Iowa State University, where he's involved with many research projects, teaching, and innovation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so from your LinkedIn profile, it looks like you've been involved with Janus particles since your PhD. And so I don't really have a lot of experience with Janus particles. So I was just wondering if you could tell us more about what that is and how it's different from normal chemistries. Sure, and I probably can give you a very concise version of the definition, but it's a very long story. Let me first give you some description about what Janus particle is. We usually deal with homogeneous particle where the chemistry is the same for everywhere on the surface of the particle. But for Janus particle, um, they usually have distinguished two different types of chemistries on the two sides of the uh, particle. So Janus is the name of an ancient Roman god who has two faces looking to the past, looking to the future. So Janus particle, uh, the name Janus used to describe these specialized particles. And I also want to mention that the name was uh, first raised by P.G. Dejens, who got Nobel Prize uh, for polymer uh, physics and also liquid crystal study. And Dejens uh, is my advisor's advisor. And actually that's how my advisor learned the Janus particle concept. Cool, so I was just wondering then from the, like, the two-sided nature of it, how does that affect like the properties of the particle as a whole or, or the material then? If, are there different properties based on like exposure to different sides? How does that work? Very good question. And uh, actually that's a, that's a very big question I have to say. And uh, that's what has been 
puzzling for the academic world for quite a while. And but let me walk back a little bit. Let's go back to Dijon's original concept, the genus particles. He, as a giant and a pioneer in uh, in the field, in the soft matter field, he actually has some really great inspirational uh, speculation about genus particles. And when he raised the concept uh, in his soft matter article, he said that if you can make these particles two sides, like a surfactant molecule, which, for example, one side is hydrophobic, the other side hydrophilic, they may go to the air water interface and form a layer. And he described that a, a skin that can breathe because the particles will pack with each other. However, they will not pack 100%. There are always some uh, gaps between these particles. So there will be transportation uh, um, through this film formed by the genus particles. That's his original description. And uh, that's one thing that you could start to imagine that these particles would have very different properties, at least compared with homogeneous particles. You know, the challenge is that uh, Dijon was a great thinker, but in reality, nobody know, knew how to actually make genus particles at his time. And actually, even after a decade, uh, he raised the concept. Nobody knew how to make high quality genus particles in large quantity. Even today, there's still a challenge for the academic world. We're still trying to make the perfect genus particles. And without uh, making the particle, being able to make the particles, and it's also very difficult for us to study the properties. I know that's not the perfect answer to your question, but I think uh, that provides you the context to understand why it's so challenging to do research with genus particles, because to make them by itself is not easy. And if you could just really quickly, how are genus particles made just briefly? Because like you said, if it's so difficult, what do we have today? And then what do you think it will look like in the future? Correct. So that actually has been a major effort in my lab. And I'm among the very first few researchers start to tackle the problem. Uh, we mentioned several methods throughout the years. And one easy method is by directional coding. If you lay down a one single layer of particles on a flat substrate, then you do directional coding. Whatever coding you do, you can do uh, gold or uh, oxide, different materials onto the top layer of the particle surface. And the particle will shadow themselves, right? So the bottom half will not be coded, only top half will be coded. So you can make a perfect 50% coverage genus particles. And then you shake roots of these particles from substrate, and then you can observe them on the microscope. If you choose a material that can block the light, and you can see these particles actually show up a very nice uh, half dark, half bright look under the microscope. That's actually my PhD work. So to actually su sum uh, summarize what I did, I simply make genus particles by this simple method and uh, look at how they uh, interact and kiss with each other on the microscope. And uh, we wrote many high quality papers from this research. I still feel surprised when I look back what I have done because uh, sometimes you feel that uh, a wonderful science paper would involve complicated instrumentation or a lot of hard try and error. But at the, in reality, the idea is so simple. You make a, a very high quality genus particle and observe how they interact with each other. This goes back to Panis' original question, how they behave uh, differently, right? So this is the first time we actually observe very clearly how they behave differently. And these particles uh, interact with each other very differently. They are no longer isotropic. So they form very interesting structures, clusters, even some long micelle structures and the warm like structures we have never observed before. And th that opens a lot of uh, interesting ideas and uh, potential new research. So that's the significance of the genus particles. That's very fascinating. And before we get into like the potential applications, which I'm excited about, I just wanted to touch on your background and your career. So like mm -hmm. David mentioned in our introduction, you have experience in industry as well as academia. And that kind of diverts from what students envision as like one or the other career routes. You know, either I go into industry or I go into academia. I was mm -hmm. just wondering how have you leveraged that unique combination of both in your material science career to make an impact in your fields of interest? 
That's a very good question. And I often have that questions from, um, from my own students. Let me say that I, I did not uh, design my career that way. Okay, like many of you, we initially trained in academia and we want to become a professor. We think that's the uh, ultimate, uh, um, the best career we could have. And uh, um, I want to become a professor at a very young age. And I, I thought that's well respected and I can do research I like. And that's the best way to utilize what I learned. And, but over the years, I changed my idea, especially after I went to industry. And uh, um, long story short, uh, I, I learned tremendously uh, in industry that I, I would never be able to learn in academic settings. And most importantly, uh, it's the first time I learned how we um, transfer technology from bench site to the market site. And I have the first hand experience about how really turn, convert, innovation and discovery in the lab into a product. That experience so um, valuable for actually for my later career. So I still leverage my inspiration in industry in my current research work. One thing I do find different is that in industry, you do have a very practical problem. You, you focus on the need from your customers instead of focus on yourself. On the other side, in academic settings, we usually focus on our own problem. I'm not saying the problem is easier, uh, but usually that comes from our um, intellectual curiosity. On the other side, uh, from industry, usually the problem comes from solving a practical issue for your customers. I cannot say that's an easy problem, actually. So, but sometimes if we stay in academic settings for a long time, we usually dismiss those, apply the problem as easy or not worthy of intellectual um, uh, vigorous. But on the other side, to solve those industry problems, it takes tremendous understanding, fundamental understanding how things work. And uh, so I think I benefit uh, from that. Look at my career. I was trained as a physical chemist. I was not even an applied scientist by training. As I mentioned to you, I observed these particles on the microscope without any clue how we can use it. And when we discussed with my advisor, Professor Steve Granick, when we were writing a paper, I asked him, I still vividly remember, I asked him, shall we put on some application at the end? Maybe we should try, say this would be good for drug delivery or anything we could think of. And Professor Granick's response is, let's don't bother you because we actually have no clue. Right. At the end, and he's correct, the challenge for um, professors, researchers only stayed in academia. They had no clue about industry problems. They had no clue this could be useful. Maybe they heard something, but it really takes experience and solid work in industry to, to gain that uh, perspective. So I was fortunate to have that, and I brought that to back with me uh, to Iowa State. And uh, um, so that tremendously benefited me. I can tell you that my first project coming back to Iowa State is to make genus particle again, but this time not by directional coding, because by directional coding, the particle can only, you can only make milligram at most of five, six milligram one batch. And it takes tremendous uh, time effort to make small quantity and expensive. They have no chance to go into the industry and, uh, and find any application. So I actually took it as my task to invent a method that can make genus particle, high quality genus particles in large quantity and they're relatively uh, affordable. So my students actually, one thing uh, you can do in academia, one, uh, one thing it's better in industry is that you can tell your students anything. So things they are young, energetic and innocent, I have to say. And I told my students, I described the rosy picture to them. If you work hard and focused, and, uh, and, uh, and follow my instructions and uh, read the literature, you'll be able to, you should be able to come with some way to make genus particle and as I described. So if we can make that, that open so much opportunities, of course, including myself, we did not know how difficult that is. Mm. So it took several students and many years and uh, for us to get there, but eventually we, we found a method that can uh, scalably make genus particles with very high quality. So that actually became a patent technology and uh, and also we started spin off a company based on that research. 
Yeah, that's a great story. And I think <clears throat> it's really interesting that you learned a lot from both sides and now together you're forging ahead. And so I'm really interested to hear more about the technology that you've invented and patented. But before there, maybe mm -hmm. we could say a back, uh, take a step back to the mm -hmm. more technical level. And yeah. maybe on the question of Janus particles, could you explain what particular materials are used in Janus particles? I know you said gold mm -hmm. and oxides, but to make it yep. mass scale, and how yep. do you ensure they have the proper chemistry uh, throughout the entire batch? That's an excellent question. Obviously, uh, it depends on your application, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a chicken and egg problem. If you if you know your application, then you know what to make. But before you know application and you don't know what to make, and on the other side, even you have a perfect application in the world, you don't know how to make the genus particle for that, use the right material, then you still end with um, nowhere. So um, I think the academia and industry is still trying to figure out. And that's why it's so important to have knowledge on both sides. And on the one hand, you can, if you search genus particles in the scientific database, you see thousands of papers every year. And sometimes I wonder, what are these papers lead to at the end of the day, right? If you dig into the paper, there's another um, researcher find another way to make a genus particles, maybe you make a little better, or they find that they can make genus particles with this new material nobody has tried before. Then you ask the question, why do we need to do that in the first place? Is that making genus particles our goal or make them useful our goal, right? So um, going back to the question, you may argue that now, if you don't know how to make genus particles, then how do you know how to use them? I, I have to agree with that. The problem is that there's no universal method to make genus particles. For example, the method I described by directional coding, use gold or uh, inorganic material would be the best way to do that. And But you can deposit um, different particles, polymeric or silica oxides and any particles you, you want to try. People have done that. However, on the other side, if your application is uh, about using polymers, then that method would not work. If your application involves kilograms uh, a quantity of genus particles, obviously the scale is impossible, right? So you then have to find the proper method to make genus particles. What we have tried in our lab is uh, making genus particles these days using a, a method called emulsion polymerization which actually has been used in coding industry, which I learned at Dow. So this method, the advantage is it's scalable. It's, it's very uh, relative cheap because you have to industrialize it and commercialize the technology. There are platforms you can just plug in once you establish a method to make the particles in large quantity. And, but this cannot give you some other properties that can be made by the uh, directional coding method. So it's all depends on your application. There's no one fitting all solution. And that's a challenge, but also that's a fascinating part for this research. And you keep making new particles and searching for new directions of utilizing these particles. So I had a question there then with that process, is that limited to just like the polymer materials um, in terms of creating these Janus particles or what's kind of in scope there? And then I know you mentioned the chicken and the egg problem in terms of potential mm -hmm. applications, which I think we'll, we'll get onto later. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for example, I guess I could see polymer as being used in, in drug delivery applications. So I was just wondering kind of what's in scope for, for your research lab in particular. Right. So, you know, I had some drug delivery experience and I exactly know. So, of course, uh, when you try to innovate, you put everything together, you find inspiration with your prior experience. And uh, I know how to make genus particles. I did coating research. I did drug delivery research. But at the end, I picked the coating research as our application. And the reason is uh, I, uh, when I worked for the drug development, I started to realize there's so much constraint you have to go through with the drug development. Compared with the coating industry, I'm not saying coating is easy. On the other side, the, the materials you can utilize for drug development is very, very limited, right? You, can, you need to test the safety and uh, um, degradation sometimes, and you have to decide which drug to use. And you, at the end, you need to have a collaboration with a good clinician to go through the clinical trial. And, and uh, after evaluating all these challenges, I decide coating materials may be the easy route. 
But by saying that, uh, I'm also thinking that if we devise some genus particles for coding application, fully understand how they behave and how they diffuse, how they assemble, maybe some of knowledge I learned over there could be carried to uh, drug delivery research. And uh, you just have to pick the battle. I pick the coding material research battle for now. And, but you have a very good question. And uh, these particles potentially could be utilized in many different areas. We just need more research uh, on that. Awesome. Well, then I guess my next question there would just be, you mentioned your focus is on coatings. And so mm -hmm. what industry could that, or are you envisioning that impact is made in? Because I know coatings can right. be present in aerospace, construction, et cetera. Right. When we talk about coatings, it's actually one interesting feature is it's everywhere, right? But it's also very different. The coatings we put on the wall is very different from the coating you put on, for example, airplane surface, because the requirement is different. Interior coating and exterior coating is different. Deck coating is different from floor coating. Uh, what we are focusing on currently is architecture coating and interior wall coating. When I first started this idea, we thought um, it's very simple. You make some genus particles, we put on the surface, hope that it will become a good coating, okay? And it turned out to be very bad coatings. So if you, we made some really nice genus particles and we can make large quantity as I mentioned through our emulsion polymerization. And uh, we're very thrilled because when we look at them under the uh, microscopy, they show wonderful uh, morphology. And they also show very interesting behavior when we study the assembly and uh, um, how they diffuse. But when we just blindly apply to surface, hoping they become a good coating, and they turn out very, very so low quality coating. They don't hold up very well. And even you easily, you, you can scrap, scrap on the surface, they, they disintegrate in no time. Mm -hmm. And when we start to examine the problem, it came to me very um, clearly. The genus particle, half of them is one property. The other half is another property. If you force them together, they don't like to stay with each other. Make sense? And, and they, they fight with each other. So you build a coating out of it, they don't work that way. Coating needs a lot of integrity and also, and uh, um, they have to come together form a very strong film. Genus particles, they don't like to do that. But suddenly it came to me is that maybe I was trying the wrong thing. Instead of trying to reinvent a new coating system with the genus particles, I should work with the current coating system because in coding industry, they have been optimized for these polymers for many years. And, uh, and um, um, through my training at Dow, I learned that coating materials simply are particles, uh, simple polymeric particles. These are fluffy particles and they are um, very stable in the aqueous suspension because nowadays we, we change the uh, solvent mostly to uh, water. There are many technologies developed to stabilize these polymeric particles in water by adding surfactant, dispersant, and design their different composition and also surface chemistry. And then when you dry the coating on the substrate, for example, you brush your paint on the wall, simply these water molecules evaporate away, leave the polymers behind. And these fluffy small polymer uh, spheres, they start to uh, interact with each other, penetrate each other and holding hands together. Eventually they form very nice fume. And the, the trick part is to design very uh, uh, delicate chemistry composition so that they, they're stable in the solution, but once they dry, they come together form very nice fume. So imagine if you over stabilize them, they never hold hands with each other, the coating fume probably will be bad. However, if they interact too strongly, they come down very quickly and it would be better for the coating uh, performance, but it would be very bad for the stability. They may gel out before the customer even start to use the coating, right? So this is a balance you have to do as R&D scientists in the industry. And that leads to a very common challenge is that you have to add a little bit solvent to help you. Then those are called uh, volatile organic compound, VOC. Without adding any VOC, your coating performance will never be good. They are either unstable or the film is too tacky, too soft. So people have to design polymer and then add solvent. The solvent can be uh, 100, 200. That means 100 gram per liter. 
VOC. And once you paint these, uh, uh, put these coatings on the surface, these VOC come out. Actually, they evaporate uh, to the environment, cause pollution. And uh, there's a big industry push and also EPA trying to regulate how much uh, VOC we put in the paint. It's a small quantity, sounds like small quantity, 100 gram per liter, but imagine how many households are painting walls every day. So it, it will result in big pollution, especially in California, the Orange County I visited last time had a smog situation. And you can just see the element in the, in the air, it's, it's hazy, right? That actually is exactly caused by the VOC. So they have very strict regulation how much you can put in paint. And that gave you the challenge as an R&D scientist in, in the coding industry, how you actually can come up with new material, lower the VOC as much as you can, but maintain the paint quality. And we thought about that. So how about we utilize that uh, material developed in coding industry, instead of making a complete new coating with generous particles, let's actually use general particle as an additive. Let's see what we can help Instead of reinvent the wheel, let's just try to assist the, uh, to solve the problem. And to our surprise, by adding only 5% of generous particles, the coating becomes much more rigid without using any solvent. Mm -hmm. And we were surprised and initially what happened. Then we did a lot of fundamental work, we realized that generous particles, we discovered, actually we discovered a new phenomenon by doing that, mixing generous particles with homogeneous particle Genus particles, by some magic, they will just go to the interface by themselves. They're not, they don't like to mix with homogeneous particles. They want to go by themselves. And the only place they can go is that air water interface. So by adding even 5% of particles, you draw down the paint. Imagine that 5% particle, genus particle, all go to the interface. And they start to orient with themselves. They orient with their hydrophobic or water, water dislike part to the air and with their water-like part to the uh, water. And we can design the surface differently. Remember, it's a genus geometry. We can design the water-like part with adhesion and what is like part with uh, water resistance and also other properties. So genus particles provide a method for us to modify the surface property without, com without complete changing the coating materials. And uh, that really is a hard moment for us is uh, we tried very hard at the beginning to completely replace the old coating materials, we realize that we don't need to do that. We can keep using the commercialized coating materials, but add a little bit of genus particle as an additive. And since we, they all go to the surface, we're still trying, trying to understand why, but we take advantage of their behaviors to go into the surface, we cause stratification. And then we can very precisely alter the surface properties without using any solvent molecules. Now you have the best of both worlds, you can make a very strong adhesion polymers down in the bulk, but then you can design very rigid and water resistant layer on the top, right? So without using any solvent again. So we think that this could have a big potential to help industry further lower down their pollution to the environment. And it provides a very interesting approach to modify surface property. Imagine now you carry some function group like antiviral uh, function group, antibacterial, antimicrobial function group, then you make a self-cleaning surface. And if you put on your wall or your doorknob and the people, um, you know, the COVID time, we always try to clean our hands five times a, a day, right? Imagine these area, especially in the hospital, they're self-cleaning. There's no virus can survive on this surface. You create a much safer, better environment. So we're so excited about this new technology. We think there are many more we can discover. And so that's what we're trying very hard in the lab. Yeah, I think that's a great story. And especially because from what I know is that making a slight tweak to what's already there is so much easier to implement mass scale than trying to completely reinvent it. I guess a question for you is, it makes sense that you're focusing on such a um, like distinct group, which is just codings in mm -hmm. 10 years. What other mm -hmm. applications do you think Janus particles could have on industry? Uh, like some from some of your papers, concrete drug delivery and some other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as a scientist, I, I don't like to speculate too much. <laughs> so, but we always want to have a vision, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say that Janus particles can be applied to any place you're using colloids, particles. They're everywhere in the food, in the drug, 
in the patchouli industry, they were utilized to harvest oil. They were utilized for separation. And uh, I can imagine that gens particles can be useful in all these areas. And however, I think the danger is to scratch the surface. We just make some genus particle and force the application. And if it didn't work, we gave up and move on, right? A little success we achieved with coatings is simply because I have a thorough understanding how coating materials work. And we tried initially, it did not work, but we did not give up. We're searching for new ideas, right? And, and fundamentally, you have to understand how things work together. And it takes a perseverance and knowledge to get there. And I believe that genus particles in 10 years, I hope, it becomes a common commodity material instead of such a special material. Because mm -hmm. the, now, even for now, you still cannot buy it. And we're still trying very hard to come up with the method to fully scale the production. And also, and uh, as you mentioned, it is uh, much better, easier to utilize that as additive so that people would accept that technology easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you work with coding industry, you realize these coding people are notorious stubborn. And I don't blame on them because you want to tweak anything, you want to change the pH slightly, you may ruin their product. Mm -hmm. Coding is a complicated system. Changing one element may not just change one property, it can change the whole properties. And that's why even when I trying to pitch them the idea of genus particle, they're still skeptical. They don't know whether adding a small quantity of additive will completely change their coding performance. In reality, it did. The genus particle really completely changed the surface properties. We're, we're just hoping that change is good for, for, the, for the coatings, but we have to do try and error many times. So on the other side, I would say that that's what my hope for is that through coding material research, we demonstrate that we prove the concept that genus particles can be easily utilized for uh, coding applications. And with this first success, we can reach out to other areas that utilize in colloidal particles. You know, the milk we drink is colloidal proteins, right? And in drug delivery, there are a lot of lipids we use to protect the drug. You know, the, the, the recent advancement of mRNA vaccine, the core technology is using a lipid that can protect mRNA at high temperature, right? So if you think about these problems, they're seemingly unrelated, but actually they have all these connections about the colloidal science, particle science. And that's exactly what I train for. And I like to utilize my knowledge to keep pushing the technology. And I hope that genus particles become a common tool for people and they're easily available, very affordable. So any researchers have a new idea they wanna try and they can test them out. For example, in drug delivery field, people utilize these um, lipids and in the cosmetic industry, in many other industry, people utilize surfactant, dispersant. I'm hoping genus particle become another candidate. When you think about improving your research, improving the product, not just to think about small molecules, but now genus particles available. You can buy some genus particle, try and put in your formulation, see how that improve. So that's my hope that it becomes a readily available tools product for the industry instead of a fancy concept uh, in the gens paper 20, 30 years ago. So that's my hope. I cannot promise it will be a huge hit on the market or mm -hmm. I don't even know how successful my company would be. And also to make a lot of money is not my goal, to be honest with you. And I, and I feel very proud at this stage, even though we only see limited success that I can take over the gens concept and to take advantage of my blended background in both industry and academia and develop something that we never had before. And, and, uh, and, uh, and also hopefully um, we can eventually come up with a product that can generate tangible impact in our everyday life. And that's probably uh, my dream also. Yeah, no, that's just an amazing dream. And so I guess well, our next question is, you kind of segue perfectly into it is that that's your goal. And so to achieve that, what are the main like blocking steps? What do you need to overcome in your technology or maybe market adaptation for your goal to succeed? Excellent question, um, David. I think because my blended background and I do uh, see the, um, have a different perspective about how 
you can uh, translate the technology to market. First of all, I have to emphasize technology-wise, we do have a lot of work to do. It's not simple or easy. And uh, I like to have a even more fundamental understanding, as I mentioned, this unique behavior of genus particles all go to the interface very quickly in, in a dynamics we never uh, observed before. We don't understand. I'm trying to work with simulation scientists and we work with uh, um, um, colloidal physicists trying to understand what's going on. So that's a collaborative work is going on. We're trying to write a grant proposals and secure more funding to do that. On the other side, I have to say that doing a great job in academic research may not be enough in this case. So um, that's why I mentioned about the startup company. And I have a very different philosophy about startup company. And uh, many entrepreneurs, they have a big dream to make a lot of money and to be successful. Uh, I don't want to be sound arrogant saying that I don't want that. Of course you want uh, being successful. However, the major driving force for me to start a company is to help train my students and help to reach to the market. And uh, this is a wonderful vehicle for us, for us to commercialize the technology developed in the lab. Not just about uh, making a lot of money, but also trying to see whether we can further push in the technology to the market. And I learned tremendously. And I have to praise Iowa State in this case that in the, in the Iowa State has a very uh, a wonderful ecosystem for us to um, carry out the research in, in, a, in a more industry settings. And they provide us resource and also even space and, uh, and to launch the business. And, uh, and uh, it takes not just the technology to get there, but also takes teamwork. And we also received a very generous help, especially from ISU uh, alum. And one of the ISU uh, alumni uh, who is a successful entrepreneur himself and don um, very selfish, selfishly donate his time and guide the company through uh, many different development stage. And we're also lucky uh, to find a local collaborator. So we now work very closely with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a coding company a regional coding company, Diamond Vogel, to commercialize the technology because coding uh, is a complicated industry. So there, there's no way you can just do it by yourself. So you really have to uh, dive in the industry and uh, it takes tremendous power, financial power and, uh, and human resource to do that. Uh, I often find myself now um, trying to balance my time between my academic research and also commercialization. However, on the other side, I think that as a scientist, we should not leave everything to the industry. So we should not think that it's a great technology. Once we find patent, someone will pick it up and develop into product. Sometimes maybe it's best to take things into your own hands and push through that first stage and show the uh, proof of concept, the minimal viable product. And once you demonstrate successfully to people, this is, can be really commercialized and then other people may pay attention. So to push through that initial stage is difficult and usually it's not being appreciated. So, but I think that uh, researchers, scientists, uh, even in university can do a lot to work in that direction. It takes time, effort, and some luck, but I think uh, it also broadens our horizon. And, and, uh, and to me, the best return is uh, to see my students start to take ownership because now when they work on the startup, they realize all the skills, the knowledge they learn in the lab is not something that only end up in the paper. Now they can leverage that to develop a product. Now they truly understand why we do certain things certain way, right? Now they understand the fundamental interaction lead to the stability and also the, all these chemistries we created, complicated chemistry can lead to wonderful functionality to the coating materials. And they start to take ownership and develop their own ideas. So I've, I find it's very fulfilling at the end and to see my, see my students grow in that regard. I love that. And speaking of your students, I was just wondering if you had any advice for material science and engineering students that are looking to get involved in innovation. It's clear that your lab is very focused on innovation and all the, the challenges and aspects that come with it. But 
similar to starting a company, you know, starting like an on-campus club requires innovation and teamwork to certain extents. Um, do you have any advice on students who may not know exactly how to get started or how to get the resources they need, but they want to succeed in, you know, starting a company or starting an on-campus club or, or whatever? Wonderful question. I just can talk to my own experience. Sure. I think that we, we have a misconcept that if we are the best technical person, then we develop the best technology. We have to be more open-minded. So the best technology may not lead to the best product. Then you ask, what else can you do, right? I want to emphasize two things. First is people. You need the best people to develop the best product. And it's not the technology, it's people who drive the technology. And the second, it's just my personal opinion, it's the timing. And it's very important that you find the right product to work on the right time. It may not be the best technology, but if the product is much needed by the customers or by the industry, then that's a great product. Maybe you have to adapt what you learned towards that direction instead of trying to just develop by your own. And uh, uh, I think um, that's why I think I encourage all the students, if you want to do entrepreneurship or innovation, it doesn't matter where you start. Maybe you can start with your own technology, but then it's important to be open-minded and you should look at what other people are doing and really talk to many different people, do a customer discovery, call them up and ask, what do you want? Instead of trying to sell your own technology. If it turns out what they want is different from what you can do, it's fine to switch gear and make what they want. And at the end of the day, um, you are fulfilling a need, you bridge a gap. And trust me, what you learn in school, you may not use everything you learn in school, but many things, if you know how to pivot, apply, and they're super useful. So that's what I want to encourage our students do. And uh, innovation is not just uh, your imagination. It takes a lot of imagination and takes a lot of creative work, but it's also hard work and your homework, background work, research. And uh, it's also about human interaction and understand other people's needs is more important than just understanding your own technology. So that's what I learned. And uh, our first product, um, you may be surprised, is not uh, a wall coating, anything. It's actually a wood stain product. So um, you may wonder why Genesis Particle has anything with wood stain, right? You, you talked to, about so many fantastic properties. Now you throw a wood stain there. The reason is simple because Diamond Vogel, Diamond Vogel wants to uh, innovate their wood stain. That's their need. And I'm not going to force my Genesis Particle concept on them because uh, they have to find it's useful. On the other side, they came back to me saying, our wood stain needs to be improved. And we have been struggling for many, many years. We could not do it. Can you help us? And we find a way to help them. And actually we find Genesis Particles really help their wood stain. And that, that, that's a happy ending. But I'm saying that um, you really have to look at what their problem is. Um, and, and find a way to bridge your knowledge, to apply your knowledge over. And that becomes super powerful when you equip, you equip the knowledge of the fundamental science and you know exactly what the industry wants to solve, what your customer need. So bring them together. So um, that's my suggestion. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. There's bad VOCs like volatile organic compounds, right? But then there's good VOC, which is just voice of customer, right? And it's important to just <laughs> be able to hear that, you know? Um, and I, I, think, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think we we incorporated that into a similar extent with the podcast, but also, you know, at Georgia Tech with our Material Advantage Club, where you're just hearing our peers in terms of, you know, what would they like to see more of? And that's kind of what sprung the idea of like a spring career fair, for example. So, um, that's just an example of how it can be incorporated into an on-campus club in addition to everything that you've talked about with starting a company. And so really love that advice and really excited about everything that you and your lab are working on. It's awesome to see and I can't wait to see, to track its journey. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, David and Puneeth. And I, I have to say that as a, as a material scientist over the years, I struggle to define myself, you know, and uh, we are not physicists, we're not chemists, and uh, we're not biologists. So who, 
who are we, right? And at the end of the day, I find that it doesn't matter anymore, right? And you can work on energy research, you can on biomedical research, you can work on coding materials. So don't limit yourself. And, uh, and I, I find it's a wonderful journey actually. And uh, it's very different from what I imagined. I can tell you when I went to MIT, all I was thinking is about curing cancer, right? And to, to find a silver bullet to solve the hardest problem for the mankind. I never imagined after a few years, I was watching paint dry in the, <laughs> in the lab. Okay. And uh, a few years later, I was trying to uh, make Janus particles again, right? So life is full of surprise. Sometimes you just have to go with it. And what's more important is that you have to keep being open-minded. I think um, now I have a completely different concept and perspective about how to do research and what is good research. And uh, uh, it's fine, we don't know at the beginning, but we just keep searching, right? That's why it's called research. You search, you do it again, research, and do it again, right? So, and, and I really appreciate what you, uh, you guys are doing here. I think it's important to encourage our students to go out there and don't be afraid. There are a lot of good questions to ask. Do, you, do I want to stay in academia or do I want to go industry? You can do both. You can actually go back and forth like what I did. That is fine. You just need to be um, persistent and believe in yourself and open-minded. That's awesome. I can't add anything more to that. I love that advice. And again, thank you so much, Sean, for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role and company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.